This video is brought to you by my kind Patreon supporters and channel members. If you enjoy my content and seek to take your support a step further, you can freely join my Patreon or become a channel member with several added benefits. With that out of the way, enjoy today's content. With the war in the East now being won and the Russians out of the war, the German Empire focused all of their forces and might on the Western Front, believing victory to be in sight, and how the Empire was going to triumph over the remaining Entente powers. But unfortunately, this victory never came, and now that the United States had joined the war, the tides turned against the German Empire. And with a food crisis back at home, the soldiers deserting and becoming completely demoralized, the Germans saw no other choice but to surrender before their country turned into complete chaos. And Wilhelm II watched all of that go down with his own eyes. Despite trying to desperately prevent the First World War, as well as trying everything in his power to secure an armistice during the war and return to the status quo, it was all completely in vain. And now the entire country was turning on him, blaming him for an issue he tried to solve from day one. With his country now falling apart and being on the brink of revolution, the Kaiser saw no other choice but to abdicate his throne and go into exile, as Germany started descending into lawlessness and revolution. A lot of people criticized this move of the Kaiser, stating how he was being entirely selfish, leaving his country to crumble while he tried to save himself and bring all his luxuries with him sitting in a mansion in the Netherlands instead of doing his duty and being there when his country needed him the most. But I am here to once again bring a new perspective on the matter, as well as giving additional context as to what led to this tragic state of instability, as well as why the Kaiser decided to abdicate in the first place as the final and fitting end to this series. This is a topic that I unfortunately left out from the last part of the Peace Kaiser, so I would like to make up for it by talking about it right now. In order to understand the unrest that was happening across Germany, as well as one of the reasons why the German Revolution happened, one must learn about the British blockade of Germany, also known as the Starvation Blockade. When the war began, the Royal Navy established a blockade in the North Sea around Germany's coastline, preventing any German ships from leaving port or even entering Germany. And this was especially the case for trade. By 1914, 25% of grain and other foodstuff in Germany was imported, and with the blockade, a quarter of Germany's food supply had now virtually disappeared and the war would make the food situation even worse, because now Germany had to actively secure and provide their soldiers with food, meaning that even more food was taken away from the civilian population. With the quarter of the food supply gone, and more supplies being directed towards the front lines, this left German civilians in an extremely difficult situation, as they would begin to slowly starve. This is exactly what Admiral Alfred von Tirpitz warned about all the way back in the 1890s, and used it as his prime justification as to why Germany needed to build up a strong navy. Because in the events of a blockade, all German trade would be halted, and that blockade needed to be broken as soon as possible. However, even if Tirpitz planned on using the German Imperial Navy against the British, during the war he had no control of the base of operations for the Navy, since he held an administrative position. With the Navy now stuck in the ports and with no way to break the blockade, the domestic situation was worsening month by month. In 1917, Woodrow Wilson ordered the seizure of neutral Dutch merchant ships in American ports and a complete blockade of Dutch ports to prevent any exports from reaching Germany. Fish had been a primary import from the Netherlands and was seen by Germans as the only reliable food they could eat, but with the blockade tightening, consumption of fish fell by 75%. 
at the same time, a lack of fertilizers, a series of poor potato harvests, and the death of able-bodied men and horses to work on the land, led to a complete failure of the agricultural programs Wilhelm had previously encouraged. In the end, this resulted in an average 20% loss in weight for the average German, and worst of all, since the beginning of the blockade until late 1918, over 800,000 people died due to malnutrition. This is why the blockade was known as the Starvation Blockade, and it played a pivotal role in Germany losing the First World War, and the horrors that followed in the aftermath. Both civilians and soldiers were practically starving, and if history has taught us anything, it's that when people get hungry, it never goes well. And this time, they were raising their pitchforks at the wrong people. With the Americans now involved in the war, General Erich Ludendorff and Paul von Hindenburg recognized that the moment American troops arrived on the Western Front, it would mean the end for any hopes of winning the war, which is why they agreed on one last push and means to end the war. This operation would be called the Kaiserschlacht, or Emperor's Battle. In the beginning, the operation was going extremely well. The German stormtroopers managed to break through the front and were rapidly approaching Paris, until it was in their sight. However, the troops were moving so fast that they outstripped their supply line, leaving the room wide open for an Entente counterattack, and General Ludendorff had a mental breakdown after his stepson was killed in the operation, which would make matters worse. Both Hindenburg and Ludendorff warned Wilhelm that the only means of negotiating a fair peace was to implement various internal reforms to make the country more democratic. In response to this, Wilhelm appointed his liberal-minded cousin, Prince Max von Baden, as the Chancellor. Max stated to Wilhelm that they needed to just hold out a little longer for victory, but Wilhelm was pessimistic and said that the only means of saving the monarchy was to negotiate an armistice. In 1918, US President Woodrow Wilson addressed Congress with his so-called 14 points, on which he stated that the durable peace could be secured. Chancellor Max stated that the German government would be ready to accept all 14 of these points in order to ensure peace, but Wilson had other plans in mind, as he then delivered a direct message, stating that as long as the Kaiser remained on the throne, the United States was unable to negotiate and would therefore accept nothing less than an unconditional surrender. Wilhelm was shocked and furious when he heard of Wilson's demand. Despite agreeing to the 14 points, Wilson had it specifically out for him. Quote, the hypocritical Wilson has at last thrown off the mask. Don't you see? The object of this is to bring down my house and to set the monarchy aside." End quote. When the note was shown in the German newspapers, one headline stood out from them all. Capitulation or negotiation. The German people, starving and war-weary, were clearly being coerced into demanding Wilhelm's abdication. And then, the Social Democrats and other independent socialists started smelling blood in the water and were quick to seize their moment. One Social Democrat politician in the Reichstag would state, quote, The question can no longer be evaded. Shall it be war with the Hohenzollerns or peace without the Hohenzollerns? End quote. At this point, Wilhelm was faced with a terrible dilemma. Not only was he firm in not breaking his oath as King of Prussia, but in the view of the events in Germany and the growing social unrest, and with his knowledge on what happened to nations after a Republican Revolution, he genuinely feared what would become of Germany without a monarchy. All the while in Berlin, Max and his government were caving into pressure from the Social Democrats, who by now were fully committed to having the Kaiser abdicate in order to end the war, but Wilhelm could see the writing on the wall. Instead of staying in Berlin, Wilhelm chose to go out amidst his troops in Flanders, where, according to him, he would be much more capable in opposing them. Quote, Prince Max's government is trying to throw me out. At Berlin, I should be less able to oppose them than in the midst of my troops." End quote. 
Despite the incredible difficult state of the army on the Western Front, when Wilhelm arrived in Flanders, he was, according to witnesses, greeted with wild cheering by his soldiers, and considering the state of the morale of the soldiers, Wilhelm was relieved to have been welcomed so warmly. However, his absence from the capital was seen by many as a means of avoiding the question of his abdication, which just further radicalized the Social Democrats in their effort to end the monarchy. As the country was rapidly descending into chaos, it was clear that all hope of victory was lost. A horrified Wilhelm received numerous reports from Berlin, informing him that the entire country was turning against him, and so, on November 8th, he summoned his son, Crown Prince Wilhelm, and Ludendorff's successor, General Gröner, on what they should do next. Gröner presented a devastating picture of a country in a state of revolution, where soldiers were deserting en masse as city after city started falling in the hands of the revolutionaries, as all of Germany was starting to turn against the Kaiser. While these discussions were taking place, Chancellor Max telephoned Wilhelm personally and described him the state of the government back in Berlin, and he plainly told him that the situation was spiraling out of control and out of his hands, and that unless he abdicated, there was no hope for the monarchy in Germany. As Crown Prince Wilhelm would write, quote, the Kaiser received the news with grave silence. His firmly compressed lips were colorless, his face was livid, and had aged by years. Only those who knew him as I did could penetrate that mask of calmness and self-control, maintained with such an effort." End quote. Realizing that there was no alternative, Wilhelm prepared a written response for the Chancellor, declaring that he would abdicate as German Emperor if further bloodshed can be hindered, but he would remain as King of Prussia and would personally lead his soldiers back to the Fatherland. But before the declaration had even been finished, Wilhelm received devastating news that Max, of his own volition, declared that Wilhelm had abdicated both as Emperor of Germany and King of Prussia, and that the Crown Prince also waived his right to the throne. Wilhelm and the army were completely shaken to the core by these news. At this point, Wilhelm had two options. He would either accept his complete abdication, even if it was illegitimate, or, since he still had the army on his side, he would march with his troops all the way to Berlin, arrest Max and his government, and completely dismiss the parliament, which would undoubtedly cause a civil war. Crown Prince Wilhelm was more than eager to choose the last option, as he started rallying his troops in support of his father, getting ready to march all the way back to the capital. However, Wilhelm himself had different plans. He declined the offer by his son, and after much soul-searching and pressure from his generals, he realized that he had no other option but to leave his country and go into exile. This is completely contrary to what people assume when they say that Wilhelm left and fled the country like a coward, ignoring his duties, when in fact he did the only sensible option. He very well had the power to march with his army back to Berlin and take control of his country, but by doing so, he would cause a civil war, and after the horrors of the Great War, Wilhelm did not want to cause further pain and suffering to the German people. Quote, I consciously sacrificed myself and my throne in the belief that, by doing so, I was best serving the fatherland. I decided to leave the country since, in view of the reports brought to me, I must believe that by doing so, I am most faithfully serving Germany, making a better armistice possible and peace terms for her, and spare her further loss of human lives, distress, and misery." End quote. And so it was, on the evening of the 9th of November, he set out for the Dutch border, a broken man who nonetheless believed that to the end he was serving his country, and his last contribution to both his people and country as emperor.
In the beginning of part 4 of the series, I mentioned how the Entente powers were planning on putting Wilhelm on trial after the war. Had the tribunal ever taken place, two specific charges were to be leveled against the Kaiser, that he pre-mediated and caused a war, and that he conducted it in an illegal manner. The strong quote-unquote evidence against the first charge was the supposed rapid militarism of the German army, as well as his rapid expansion of the navy, a topic I covered in detail in part 2. But as has been shown, he viewed this as a defensive move, since historically, Germany had been surrounded by enemies and his neighbors were arming themselves more rapidly than he was. This was something an American diplomat noticed in 1915. Quote, now, who was really ready for this war? England with the combined navies of Russia, France and Japan, and a peace footing army of 2,260,000 men, or Germany with her standing army of 672,000 men, her untried navy, and her obligations to hard-pressed Austria-Hungary on her hands? End quote. The argument that Wilhelm precipitated the war through his encouragement of militarism therefore fails to stand. As the British playwright George Bernard Shaw wrote, quote, We must not pretend that militarism and the inevitable war between England and Germany is a Prussian infamy for which the Kaiser must be severely punished. We began it, and if they met us halfway, as they certainly did, it is not for us to reproach them. End quote. Now, if Wilhelm truly sought to go to war with Britain and Russia ever since he became Kaiser, then that leaves one big question. Why would he wait till 1914? Around 14 years earlier, during the height of the Boers' War, most of Europe was fiercely anti-British, and Wilhelm himself even stated to his grandmother Queen Victoria that he received numerous requests for alliances, but he declined them all. And if he had wanted to go to war with Russia, there would have been no better time to strike Russia than in 1905, when they suffered a humiliating defeat at the hands of the Japanese, and as the country was erupting into revolution. These were two perfect moments to attack both of these countries and fulfill his supposed goal. So why, if he really wanted war, why did he not take these perfect opportunities? And that takes us to our next question. What would Wilhelm's motives even be for starting the war? As I have shown numerous times throughout the series, Wilhelm didn't have any territorial ambitions in Europe, and in fact, throughout his reign, Germany had only prospered, and a war, something he himself said, would bring irreparable damage to the trade on which that prosperity depended. So what would his motives even be exactly? The Entente, on the other hand, in fact all three, France, Russia and Britain, had every reason to go to war with Germany. Britain resented and feared Germany's economic success as the German market was becoming superior to the British one. France was anxious to retake Alsace-Lorraine, and Russia, which was economically tied to France, was desperate to acquire new ports and to gain greater influence in the Balkans. So, let's recap on this. The Entente powers, with each member having a justifiable reason to go to war with Germany, are accusing Wilhelm, the man who had absolutely no motive at all to go to war, for presumably causing the conflict? Words cannot describe how much of a joke this charge is. Even the members of the commission must have realized that Wilhelm was innocent of the charges leveled against him, because there is only one conclusion to be made. The majority of the commission was not influenced by the legal argument. They appeared to be fixed in their determination to try and punish the ex-Kaiser. From everything I have talked about since part 1, there is one logical conclusion to make. Wilhelm II was deliberately used as a scapegoat and as a means to bring down everything he had built up, and to reduce Germany to nothing more than a rump state that may never challenge British and French dominance ever again. All these talks of a mental illness, warmongering, 
It's all a lie, because His Majesty Wilhelm II was truly the Peace Kaiser of his time, and is an individual who is innocent before God and men.